Welcome to the Observer Research Foundation Mumbai's Wednesday webinar series. Our topic of discussion today is uh, ORF Senior Fellow Kabir Taneja's new book uh, called The ISIS Peril. Kabir has contributed uh, extremely valuably to uh, the the information and the knowledge on ISIS, particularly from a South Asian perspective, his work uh, on uh, terrorism and counterterrorism strategies, looking at this global group and how it impacts Indian security uh, is an extremely, as I said, valuable addition to existing literature on ISIS from a particularly Indian perspective. Now, in order to do this, of course, Kabir has uh, looped together some of the history of the group, its genesis and its linkages in countries like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Uh, he looks at the Easter bombings. He looks at the Holy Artisan Bakery uh, attack that took place in Bangladesh, the evolution uh, of the ISKP in Afghanistan, uh, and the security implications for India. Uh, we're also going to be joined uh, uh, our discussants for today's web uh, webinar, Raffaello Pantucci of Rusi in uh, the United Kingdom, joining us live, though, of course, from Singapore to this evening, not from London. And we're hoping to get uh, Indrani Bhakchi, the diplomatic editor of the Times of India, uh, on this as well. But I would like to actually ask Kabir uh, to talk to all of us about the topic of his book, I mean, this was a gap in existing literature on ISIS, the, the view from India, the view from South Asia. But what were, uh, what was your intention in writing the book? What were some of the limitations you actually had to deal with as you were gathering information? Because uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of reportage, which would not have been really easy to do as well. So talk us through a little bit about the process as well as uh, the intent. Uh, yeah, thanks, Maya, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us this uh, this evening, and I hope everyone's staying safe at home. Uh, I think uh, uh, writing this book was uh, not a very easy task, and as soon as I signed up to do it, I had a lot of doubts of how this is actually going to turn up. And the reasons for that was, I think, that everyone saw it was just how rapidly the situation was changing with the rise of the Islamic State. It, on a daily basis, we were going through... Uh, terabytes of data that they were releasing, their um, online propaganda machinery was in hyperdrive, they were releasing absolutely uh, a burst of uh, information per day. Uh, they had very interesting approaches to themselves, uh, the, you know, you could contact them at that point of time, I'm talking about 2014, 15 and 16. Uh, when even uh, when they made a big presence on, on social media platforms and the social media giants were a little confused on how to deal with the situation because they were using the same platform that you and me use to contact each other or family and friends and they were using it for completely ulterior motives. So there was a lot happening at that point of time and, uh, it, it, and writing something down with, which had a decent shelf life at least, if not a long shelf life. Was was a very was a, was a big task. So how I approached this was, of course, taking a very balanced view of this. I did not. I tried to stay away from um, uh, covering uh, it from a reporter's perspective, right? So you try to rely more on what has happened than rather than what is happening and what will happen. Uh, and I think that gave uh, uh, that gave a very interesting sort of approach to uh, to this book. Uh, uh, I wanted it to be a very pacey read. I didn't want it to be academic per se, um, and uh, I wanted it to be approachable to literally everyone. So anyone drinking, uh, sorry, reading it from uh, at a university level to someone buying it at a railway station in India. So it should be palatable to most because I think it was very important. To, uh, and a rare occasion where we were witnessing the rise and fall of a major international terror group all at the same time. Hmm. Uh, and sort of the world sort of grappling with the situation on what to do and how to deal with it. Uh, and thanks to technology, thanks to the internet, uh, uh, you know, uh, traditional uh, boundaries were blurring. Uh, they could, uh, people who were, um, uh, uh, were interested in the ideology of the Islamic State, were able to contact each other fairly easily, discuss ideas, you know, share data, share propaganda videos, so on and so forth. So it was, um, uh, it was a very interesting uh, and challenging uh, uh, time to actually write. And I actually, before started writing it, uh, 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 talked to a bunch of people who wrote books on Islam, on Islamic, on Islamic State, Islamic State from other 
they had the same same challenges. Uh, a lot of them uh, uh, had their books that went uh, out of uh, relevance soon after publishing. And um, uh, if we see it see it from uh, the perspective of where we stand now, uh, which is uh, in 2020, where uh, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, the Caliph of Islamic State, has been killed. Uh, that, Territorial gains of the Islamic states have been diminished. They are in a very small part of Syria now, uh, and they have uh, withdrawn into becoming a largely guerrilla outfit than uh, a quasi-state that they were at that point of time. Um, and uh, similar things have happened online as well. Uh, I remember when we, st uh, when I was still a journalist at that point of time, and a lot of my data that I use in the book was collected uh, uh, during the period of uh, 2014 to 2016. Um, uh, you know, the, some of the large proponents of the Islamic State online, uh, we had the case of Shami Witness, I'm fairly certain a lot of you view, uh, viewers are familiar with the, with the title, uh, was a Twitter handle that had about 40,000 followers, was a pro-Islamic State handle, was um, into radicalizing um, uh, people and high, um, uh, recruiting people in, in the name of Islamic State. Mm. And this person was very approachable. You could drop a DM on Twitter and you could have a perfectly normal conversation in well-to-do English and ask him, why, why, why are you doing this? And, you know, what's the motive? And very frankly, they would answer you as well. Uh, and this, of course, shifted through platforms. Facebook became a thing, then Telegram became a thing and so on and so forth. It's much harder now. Uh, so if I try to do this book now, it's going to be a much uh, harder task than what it was uh, when I started uh, working on, on the data part, at least. Also, a significant chunk of this book came from a project that we did at ORF, which was the ISIS tracker. And uh, uh, the point of that and the book was that I recognized that Islamic State was becoming a larger brand internationally hmm. and actually did not have the metal of that brand uh, operationally behind it. The brand was larger than life, but what they could do as a group as an entity themselves with that brand had its fair limitations. So when we approach the brand and when we see it from a perspective of a large umbrella organization that seems to have lone wolf attacks in Europe, that is capable to do attacks in Bangladesh, that is capable to do attacks in the Middle East, of course. Uh, we've seen recent attacks in Madagascar, in Africa, in, in, in Sahel now, and so on and so forth. And even some attacks in, in the US back then. Uh, at that point of time, they seemed like they had their fingers in all the pies in the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but I, I realized that, okay, uh, that is true for the brand because they built it up so well, but it may not be operationally the same story for them. It, uh, um, you know, they, uh, while they are very well um, organized uh, uh, within the Levant, so to speak, so Iraq and Syria and on the ground there uh, till at least uh, 2018, uh, internationally, it was a very sort of uh, do-it-yourself kind of model, which mm. allowed uh, sympathizers to, um, uh, you know, become a part of Islamic State without being in the Islamic State. Mm. And that, that, that became a thing. And uh, that actually, when that started happening, it became a little easier for researchers like us, uh, who are far away from, uh, from the Middle East and uh, are unable to, let's say, have direct contact with these people. Uh, to uh, basically try and understand what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, reactions they are having globally, mm. and uh, a big um, uh, chunk of uh, gray area in this work was South Asia at that point in time, and okay. this is despite the 2016 attacks in 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 Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Um, uh, despite that, you know, there was always this sort of uh, narrative that, oh, look, South Asia has not had any major attacks, we have not had many cases, so on and so forth. But um, how it worked internationally was it took just one, one person and one event for a chain of reactions to take place, for that brand to be emboldened than what it was, and for that brand to be sort of parachuted down in regions where it never existed. So, um, uh, I, and I saw a lack of understanding uh, beyond a point uh, you know, on the narratives of Islamic State in India, and I, and this book attempts to sort of uh, sort of um, uh, you know plug those gaps. So it starts from a very basic sort of what was happening on the ground in 2014-15. What led to the situation globally, um, going back to a little bit of not too long but a little bit of history, and then it moves into uh, into a more sort of um, how operationally they were uh, 
active you know, the islamic state worked and um, and how they used the uh, the concoction of of theology and ideology which thrives offline in 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 the middle east and how they converted that to online in 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 attempts to approach uh, a larger audience base and uh, uh, and you know it's uh, specifically between um, uh, uh, 2015 and 2017 we saw uh, an explosion of of this happening uh, and during this period as well south asia was still a very silent sort of uh, place for 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 the islamic state a lot of cases were happening in europe which no one had uh, probably thought that it, that would uh, that would be the case uh, but uh, i found that the general understanding about the islamic state was 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 lacking and how they work was lacking and this whole model of um you know the brand being so big and just one person building a complete narrative in an entire state on that the islamic state has a footprint here um uh, needed uh, much more nuance than what it was getting uh, in our part of the world uh, and i'll just give, give a very quick example a lot of there are a lot of cases that we've dealt with in 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 this book as well uh, a lot of cases of uh, isis sympathizers uh, specifically more than uh, people who actually acted in the name of isis Uh, mm-hmm. people who want to act in the name of isis but were unable to do so for a plethora of reasons um, uh, one of the reasons that we found which was um, uh, which was uh, much more uh, or which was very prevalent was that a lot of people who showed sympathy for islamic state in india and i'm not talking about south asia right now but just india um, uh, wanted to actually go and live in the caliphate they didn't want to be the sort of uh, people who are sort of uh, Uh, yeah you know just attached to the name but living somewhere else conducting attacks somewhere else in the name of islamic state but not living in uh, in that uh, territorial region that the that the group controlled uh, and um, uh, we we came across a lot of cases where uh, you know the islamic state was directly in touch with someone in india and they were trying to you can see uh, the, through the exchanges on social media that they are trying to build up an ecosystem in india uh where they want these people to go out and attack someone in the city or maybe go out uh, and i'm not talking about big attacks using a machete using a knife using whatever you can find fairly easily considering guns are not uh, easily available in india uh and once they tried to sort of uh, radicalize these people in the name of islamic state by saying please stay there and conduct your attacks you can see these people lose interest uh because um, they wanted to be part of that a uh, very hollywood like um, uh, world that islamic state had created and marketed at the same time um uh, and we saw some cases of indian uh, indians who actually managed to make it there as well uh, okay, yeah and having uh, uh, completely different experiences which of course again we we dive into the book uh, um, briefly about it so um, uh, so uh, and you know going back to the debate that i mentioned about the time scale of the book uh, 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 we were just finishing the book when the sri lanka attacks happened and i can tell you for someone who was who's been working on this particular topic for the past 20 uh, sorry uh, for the past 2 uh, to 3 years um, i did not see that happening in sri lanka for example and that sort of drove home the point of how this sort of dissemination of ideology dissemination of intent dissemination of information and the brand uh uh and uh, works because uh, you can think that uh, oh, it's not going to happen in this part of the world uh, but uh, uh the islamic state is also thinking the same thing maybe that there's no one watching that part of the world hmm. so uh, so there are a lot of such nuances that we dive into it's a dissection of basically not the ideological part so much of the islamic state but the operational part and how hmm. they manage to become such a big brand that even if you are a run of the mill thief working in kashmir for example and but online you portray yourself as as an islamic state member you will for, suddenly find yourself on the front pages of all daily news uh, in india so uh, these kind of sort of uh, uh, you know uh, puddles of information uh, we we try to uh, try to stitch them together into a, a more broad understanding of why for example islamic state brand is still going to be a relevant threat despite the death of baghdadi or despite the death of uh, sorry despite the uh, yeah the death of the territory that the islamic state commanded at a point of time so that's just the uh, book in in uh, in 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 a brief uh, note basically
So, Kabir, before I go on to bring uh, the other panelists in, and Indrani, good to see you finally having joined us. I know we had some technical trouble in the beginning. Uh, Kabir, I just want you to uh, elaborate on one aspect of your book, which I found particularly interesting, because this is where it's also sort of uh, segued with the kind of work that I've been doing on CVE, for example, um, which you're familiar with. Um, you look at Kerala, and you look at the kind of psychology of the, the ISIS uh, uh, recruit, so to speak, from yeah. Kerala, especially the one who's gone overseas. We've also seen that broadly, even if you compare uh, other South Asian countries, if you look at Pakistan, you look at Bangladesh uh, in particular, uh, that uh, India's recruitment numbers have been on the lower side and geographically kind of localized uh, uh, as well. So what did, what emerged for you as one of the reasons for that uh, and is it something that the Indian state can take comfort in, can be confident about? Are there lessons from this experience that India can perhaps share with other countries who are grappling with the very real uh, sort of dangers of radicalization and recruitment? Yeah, so that's a good question because uh, I'll just start from the Indian state question and what they can sort of take away from the low numbers that we've had. And I think I've, I've uh, beyond my book also, I've um, uh, highlighted this uh, a lot whenever these sort of sporadic cases come of one person uh, yeah. being arrested or posting something online or trying to do something in the physical world and so on and so forth, is that these low numbers, which according to the last home ministry tally was 160 or 170 or something like that, which is yes. negligible, absolutely negligible. Uh, uh, and it, But it's important for us to... Uh, you know, while or uh, while understanding that it is a very relevant long term threat, uh, it, you know, it is not an existential threat for us, but it is not something that we need to bloat up uh, more than it requires to be bloated. Uh, it, it, you know, even even if, uh, let's say, there are cases uh, in Kerala, uh, uh, I, I think uh, there have been a bulk of cases from Kerala. But that has a historical connotation to it. It's the fact that um, uh, Kerala has had direct links with, uh, with the Middle East for centuries. Uh, migration is, uh, is, is a very, uh, uh, is a daily part of uh, uh, life uh, in Kerala between the Middle East and, uh, and the state of Kerala. So uh, there are, uh, I think there are more than 2 million uh, migrants just from Kerala working in the larger West Asian region. Hmm. So uh, why the radicalization happened, and in, it's not just Kerala also, it's just Northern Kerala, it's part of Northern Kerala where it comes from. And that works uh, very often in ecosystems, right? So if one person who, let's say, is um, uh, looking after or is uh, sort of sold to this ideology during their trip to whatever part of West Asia, either they worked in or they stayed in for, uh, for a considerable amount of time, uh, uh, they come back and there is a tendency of a very sort of subtle way of radicalization taking place, which is, of course, through mostly through offline means and not online, which is quite different from uh, the global sort of uh, right. uh, example that we read from the West, at least. Um, and it's much more community uh, driven. So the, the sort of that, that thought process usually is within the community. So the person will say to a friend, you know, I, I think you should look into this, have a look at X or Y or Z. Um, maybe we'll get some money there, we'll get to shoot some guns or, or whatever the sales pitch is at that point of time for that mm -hmm. particular person. Uh, but uh, it's it's very sort of uh, concentrated within communities, within, uh, uh, within friend circles, maybe within family circles and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, we'll... Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it's quite different from uh, what we uh, it's quite different from what we uh, have observed in in the West, which is why we haven't had things like lone wolf attacks. So we have not had many of those one person running wild in a city with a car running people over. So um, uh, so it's it's quite different, and I think these these are the gaps that this book attempts to fill. That a lot of cases here are very localized and are very. Um, uh, sensitive to the thinking that exists in South Asia. So even in, in the cases that we had in Kashmir, uh, a lot of the cases were of uh, a lot of the cases were you know other militants or other existing uh, criminal activities taking place. They're just sort of wearing this T-shirt of Islamic State like is Adidas right. or Nike yeah. and getting no noticed overnight. Okay, uh, before I bring in uh, Rafaelo, I want to just take it across to Indrani. Indrani, uh, just a couple of comments from you. One is on 
uh, your views on Kabir's book as a contribution to literature on ISIS from uh, you know, perspective, uh, an Indian perspective, a South Asian perspective, but also on the other side, you know, we saw recently as well with uh, um, the attacks in Afghanistan and uh, investigations, counterterrorism operations in Afghanistan lead to uh, Indians, some Indians who were uh, recruited by ISIS or went as members of ISIS and, and got up to Afghanistan or intended to stay in Afghanistan, one is not sure. So while domestically within India, as Kabir said, it's not an existential threat given the numbers. Uh, what do you think is the sort of security thrust or what should it be given that there are these people who might be going to other battlefields abroad? I mean, what's what's the, the bigger threat in your in your view right now? I enjoyed Kabir's book very much for the simple reason that so one has been following uh, uh, the ISIS story, so to speak, but to have him center it in South Asia uh, brought home a lot of personal experiences, particularly uh, the cover, uh, covering the Dhaka attacks in 2016. Okay. And uh, I, uh, what he said about uh, the ISIS experience being rooted in the local or in the community as well as in, in local uh, circumstances is actually very um, is actually very true, especially if you, when you put it in the context of both the Dhaka uh, attacks as well as the Sri Lanka attacks, uh, both very local. And, I mean, the, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the idea that five or six young men of fairly well-to-do families uh, can disappear yeah. from their homes, from their parents' radar for uh, six months, come back and execute such a terrible attack virtually under the noses of their parents. And these are, remember, these are not parents, these are not families that uh, need to join the ISIS you will wonder what the ISIS attraction is about. And I think that's something we all have to uh, devote a little more energy to because even in Sri Lanka, if you look at the prime accused in the attacks, I mean, they're merchants, they're well off. They're well off. So it's a, a, not to speak peak of the fact that Al-Qaeda wasn't, uh, I mean, did not attract uh, the well-heeled across the world. They did, uh, ISIS uh, in a certain way too. But if you are looking at uh, addressing local grievances, or let us say addressing local problems and in local circumstances, why would uh, uh, people belonging to the upper social strata take to ISIS? Uh, and and that, uh, so that is, a, that is, I think, is an interesting uh, point of view. And I, I'm really, uh, actually, I think Kabir's book puts uh, so much uh, of the South Asian experience into perspective uh, that uh, it's like, I would say it is a, it's a must read for anybody following uh, terror in, uh, in South Asia. But to answer your second question, Maya, about Afghanistan, and yes, we did, we saw one Indian uh, you know, I have, and uh, from all the conversations I have had with security people about that particular attack, there is a lot more to that attack than a regular ISIS attack. There is a lot more because there is, it, the, uh, uh, in fact, if you, uh, a, a ORF, uh, when you organize that the ISIS uh, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, that session that you did in, in the ORF, was very interesting to see where ISIS draws its people, energy, men, materials from in Afghanistan. And it, it is not, uh, it, that is A, that is not always opposed to Al-Qaeda. It is not opposed to Haq the Haqqani network. Um, and therefore, or, or even completely opposed to the Afghan Taliban, therefore, an, uh, it is, I would say, it, an ISIS attack 
on Indian interests in Afghanistan bears much more than an ISIS stamp. Hmm. It bears an, a political stamp and that and therefore the ISIS attack will always be contaminated, if I can use that word, uh, by other groups that have a different interest, interest yeah. in India. Hmm. Okay, that's a fair point. Uh, Ra you know, we'll, we'll carry that discussion uh, uh, forward as well. But Rafalo, let me just come to you uh, because you've been studying, uh, you know, terrorism from your perspective sitting in London and we've seen the West experience with ISIS, um, with the kind of local recruitment, this, that same local element that, that Kabir pointed out, the lone wolf uh, local recruit who's acting um, on his behalf, but al al you know, allies himself with the brand and therefore uh, the brand gets its, its uh, strength from that kind of local alliance. Um, and efforts in uh, European countries to kind of target or challenge uh, that uh, particular um, attraction that, that recruits them at the local level. Uh, the point that Indrani made also, which is interesting, that the, the people in Bangladesh, the people in Sri Lanka, the kind of backgrounds they came from, the more affluent uh, backgrounds, questions about why someone like that would choose to radicalize. Uh, but in Europe, the experiences have been somewhat different and, and somewhat more mixed. You haven't only had the affluent, you've had the immigrants uh, living in the ghettos of European cities as well, who have been radicalized. So just give us your perspective on, on you know, the West's challenges and, the, and South Asian challenges, specifically uh, in the context of what Kabir has said. Sure. Um, I mean, first, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to come and join you. And let me also add my comment that, you know, this really is a, a fantastic book that I would highly recommend anyone to read. It's... Um, it's very readable, <laughs> you know, Kabir, your journalistic uh, uh, background comes through excellently. It's a very readable book. You know, I read a lot of books about terrorism and they can be quite dry. And this one is certainly not that. So, so it's a very readable and accessible text, which is a huge, is a big thing when you're reading a, a text that really is covering such a detailed subject. But to sort of turn to your uh, two specific questions and then maybe add a couple of brief comments myself. Um, about about sort of where I think where I think his book highlights, which I think is very important. I think on on the point about a well healed. I mean, it's one that's been observed that you know if you look at the ranks of jihadist groups, there's an awful lot of people who you know come from what one would think are fairly well-to-do backgrounds or backgrounds that feel very assimilated. This is true in the United Kingdom as well. If we think back to the July 2005 attacks on London's public transport system, you know, yes, they were all from. Uh, families of second generation uh, uh, Pakistani migrants to the United Kingdom, but the kids were certainly not people who were, you know, destitute and living on the streets and, you know, living lives of misery. These were people who were, you know, they, they'd been to university, they were, they were in a direction that one could definitely say was a positive one. And, you know, actually that's a fairly common profile. And I think what's so fascinating about this book and, um, you know, the research that Kabir has done here is that it highlights that this is true in an Indian context as well. And actually it's true across the kind of South Asian experience. And it's, it's you know, if, if you think about it logically, it kind of makes sense. You know, if you're gonna get involved in a sort of complicated political ideology, you have to kind of have time to do that. <laughs> you know, it's not really something you can do if you're a desperately poor person who's trying to feed himself or clothe himself or herself. You know, you need to have space to be able to say, actually, I wanna explore this side of my identity and really reach out and connect with this ideology, which is gonna offer a frame through which I can understand how I fit into the world. That is a kind of a really, it's, it's a more middle class sort of thing to do. And, you know, if we look back at history, you know, the, the Russian Revolution is the most famous one. You know, that came from the middle classes. It was, you know, the thinking class who sort of got their act together, got angry at the state and tried to overthrow it. So it's a sort of well-worn path when we're thinking about sort of political violence, that it comes from this sort of middle class. Poorer, cl poorer people tend not to get be the ones who necessarily drive these sorts of groups forwards. You know, it does tend to take someone with a bit more means to decide that they're going to start going down this path. Um, so I think that's what's so fascinating about this book is that it shows that that is true within a South Asian context as well. Because I think often sitting in the West, we tend to look at, um, at uh, you know, uh, developing world countries and say, well, the experience there must be based in the fact that it's desperate poverty and that everyone's so miserable. But actually it's not. It turns out that actually it's very much the same kind of narratives that you see of where these people are emerging from. I think the point about the lone actor side of the 
phenomenon is a very interesting one. It's an interesting question to ask. Why haven't we seen this articulated more? And the question I ask is, do we know that for sure? You know, I think in the book, Kabir, you don't really show any cases of it. And it's possible that there haven't been any, but it's also possible that they've been disrupted at different stages. And we just haven't seen the sort of attack coming forwards. The other side of the question is, why is it that we're seeing happening in uh, the West so much? And there's a number of different explanations you can look at. And a couple which may be relevant for this discussion is, there is the question about how much the security forces in the West have gotten very good at disrupting networks, right? So they've gotten very good at you know, catching a complicated network of people. They know who the people are. They're able to know how they communicate. They're able to watch those. And through that, you just kind of follow leads and you can disrupt and then job done. Um, and so from the group perspective, it becomes very difficult and a bit of a waste of resources to try to coordinate a large plot. Much better to just try to get your guys to get inspired and do stuff. And so there's much more of a push in that direction because it kind of fits the environment that they're trying to deal with. The right. other side of the coin is that we see in the West, sorry, very briefly, because I realize I'm going on a little bit, mm. is, and this is where I think it's quite interesting, I think I'd be interested to hear sort of Kabir's thoughts about this, is that the ideas have become so diffuse and so broadly kind of pushed out in every direction that we see people latching onto them who don't really have any concept of the ideology, but are doing the attack because they think it's kind of a way of expressing anger against society. And I thought it was interesting in how you wrote about Kashmir, there was an element of that coming in there, where I think some of the people you were talking about within Kashmir were using the kind of ISIS banner really as a way of just articulating anger against the state without really absorbing the ideology. And in the West, we've seen that turn into the kind of lone actor phenomenon. It's interesting that there we can see it becoming part of the garb of, uh, of how uh, the Kashmiri struggle is getting absorbed. So um, I'll maybe leave it at that, though. There is some, you know, I think it is fascinating to think about how South Asia, I think, is rising as uh, a component of the kind of global threat picture. And the attack in, uh, in Kabul is one example of this. Um, the sort of Sort Al Hind magazine that we see coming out is further. The fact that we are seeing Indian fighters going abroad, which I think is a fairly yeah. new phenomenon. I think there's something very interesting happening in South Asian jihad. And, you know, books like this are an important way of um, articulating that, uh, that, uh, that um, art. Yeah, so Kabir, let me bring this back to you because a couple of points. One, uh, Rafael touched on, which is the, the, the Kashmir flag, and that was a question from one of our uh, participants as well, uh, who has asked about what we should make of those protesters holding uh, ISIS flags. Is it just a provocation or is it uh, a more serious connection? Uh, and this kind of, you know, points uh, or alludes to the point that Indrani was also making about when we look at Afghanistan, for example, uh, you know, there, there are other interests at play and the same story would probably hold uh, with Kashmir as well. So your take uh, on that specifically, but also, um, the you know, uh, Rafaelo pointed out and you've written on it and we're doing some work on it as well right now about the idea of a publication for this, this part of uh, the world as well. And we saw, so this is a kind of second part and you can take that on. We saw some of the uh, the the repurposing, I suppose, you know, images of, for example, even the Delhi riots uh, that were used by some of these publications uh, as possibly a call to arms or a call to action. And that points to the local grievance and the, the uh, sort of expression of anger um, rather than any conviction, ideological conviction. So there are many layers and many themes, not just to understanding the group per se, but uh, you know, and how it's operating, but also those who are kind of uh, acting either in the interest of the uh, in the interest of the group, the larger interest of the group, or um, you know, just uh, as a means of of revenge or something like that. Right. Uh, so okay. So uh, that's uh, that's a lot of questions, but I'll try and be brief. Uh, uh, I'll just start with the Kashmir flag thing, right? So if you go back to 2014-15. Uh, when some of the first sort of stone pelting cases had started at that point of time uh, in in the valley, um, there was there was a case uh, of a sort of a pro ISIS ecosystem trying to develop in India at that point of time, and uh, it was a cross border one, interestingly. So there were people in Bangladesh uh, who were talking to people in India, and there were people in India who were talking to people in Bangladesh, and both of them were talking to people uh, uh, apparently who were in Afghanistan or and Syria. So uh, there was uh, there was this happening at that point of time, and um, uh, interestingly, one of the people from India got some money uh, 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 to do a recce mission, 
uh, both in New Delhi and in Kashmir. Uh, and the task was in New Delhi was to basically scout out locations for possible uh, future attacks. And the task in Kashmir was very interesting, was to basically see how the name of Islamic State flies in the valley. So one of the first pictures that came out at that point of time from Kashmir was actually this person who was out there just to test out the waters. And, um, uh, and if you see the flag carefully, the flag actually is quite incorrect in its imagery towards the right. official Islamic State that. flag. If you do that in, in, in Islamic State territory, you're not going to live very long, I presume, if the imagery and, and the messaging is incorrect to that level. Uh, but at that point of time, this person who did re, uh, fly the flag uh, of Islamic State in, in, in Srinagar, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, that person was beaten red, black and blue by the others. And the others is not the Indian police or the military here. The others is the stone pelters. Yeah. Because they didn't want this imagery to hog uh, the news cycle that they were creating. So uh, ultimately, he realized, this person realized that, okay, this at the moment in Kashmir is going to be very difficult. There are other cases where, um, uh, and uh, just sort of tapping into the whole middle class debate that Rafael was, uh, was pointing towards, hmm. uh, uh, there was another debate of another pro-ISIS person who was um, uh, taken into custody by Indian forces uh, hmm. in, or the Indian, Indian law enforcement. And in one of the sort of um, discussions they had with him uh, was... Um, so explain it to us, why not Kashmir? Why, I, why is it? Because everyone seems to be asking this, right? Uh, Kashmir seems to be quite a, a ripe example of where uh, such an entity such as ISIS can actually fester. Uh, but it's actually not true. It would be very hard for something like ISIS to actually fester in, in, in a place like uh, uh, Kashmir because they would want their fighters to not fight for the land per se. They would want right. their fighters not fight for the Indian side or the Pakistani narrative or the Hizbul narrative or the Lashkar narrative. They want the, they were, it, they want it to be a larger fight for the Ummah, so to speak. Hmm. And that narrative didn't find space in Kashmir. Uh, it, uh, but the, 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 uh, the, uh, the fear is that it may find in the future, uh, considering the separatist movement is so weak now. So they may look at something else uh, beyond uh, the separatist movement. But uh, uh, at least till now, I don't see, or even during the research of this book, uh, Kashmir, uh, from the start, I, I did not see it as a place where radicalization from an Islamic state perspective is going to, going to fly. Uh, and of course, we've seen some cases, uh, as uh, Indrani was also saying, uh, and I'm just getting into the Afghanistan part of, of your question, uh, where uh, uh, there was, I think, two cases from Kashmir of uh, militants who managed to join ISIS in Afghanistan and wanted to commit uh, attacks in India. And there are other cases from uh, Kerala and I think one or two from Maharashtra, supposedly, who managed to find their space in Afghanistan. Now, we have to remember something about ISK. I, I feel very uncomfortable when Islamic State in Khorasan in Afghanistan mm. is put under a broad stroke to ISIS in Syria or ISIS central, if we may call it. I think uh, Islamic State Khorasan was created uh, in Afghanistan out of necessity from local fractures uh, that were taking place in Afghanistan at that point of time. There was a lot of inf infighting within the Taliban. There was infighting between uh, the Pakistani Taliban and the Afghan Taliban. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, people being displaced from the uh, TTP, which is the Pakistani Taliban from Pakistan at that point of time during a military sort of pushback by, by the Pakistanis, uh, thanks to international pressure. Uh, and a lot of people who got displaced from Pakistan, who were part of the TTP at that, at that point of time, took refuge in border villages uh, in the Afghan Park ter territory that were uh, largely... Uh, Pashtun villages. So they being, TTP being largely Pashtun, found refuge in these villages. And that is where sort of slowly, slowly it started festering. Uh, the whole, uh, because they needed a new identity and it was fairly easy to make one in 2015 yeah. and 16. So Kabir, before, I mean, there, there's a bunch of people who are sending in questions and I'm, I'm not yeah. going to uh, attribute the questions, but I'll read them out. And I know that the participants will figure out those are their questions. Uh, but there's a couple for you, but there's a couple for, I think, uh, everybody else. One is, yeah. what do you think? And I think this one I'll ask Indrani as well. What, according to you all, is the attraction point for Indians to join ISIS? What is it that's, if, you know, even the 170 people 
uh, that we are talking about, what was the motivating factor? And the second, and I think this is something that all of you could answer, including you, Raffaello, um, is whether there is a link between um, you know, the political regimes of the countries where ISIS has come from or where it took root, uh, or is there just, I mean, there's, there's nothing to be made of what kind of societies they have come from. So could we, why don't you take the first bit about the uh, yeah. uh, uh, Look, uh, I, I, I know it's, uh, I, I get this question a lot uh, about, uh, you know, what, who's supporting Islamic State, who's funding Islamic State. There has to be something because if you see general theory of how groups uh, survive, there has to be one major sort of force majeure at the back pushing their agenda through. Um, and um, to a large extent, I think, at least when it comes to finances and stuff like that, I think ISIS was fairly independent. And they mm. managed to raise their own money. Uh, they took control of cities. They put their own taxes on these cities. Uh, they charged people. They extorted money. They had um, uh, uh, makeshift refineries. There's no shortage of oil in the region. Um, uh, and they made, uh, they, they, and they um, uh, took over a lot of ex pre-existing uh, smuggling routes. Right. So they did, you know, they, they, there's this, there was a level of independence that they had, and that is true. I'm sure they got support from some uh, people in other countries who donated money and so on and so forth. But, uh, 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 but you know, that, that's, that's, uh, that's a large part of how ISIS managed to exist. Now, uh, coming to the question of, uh, you know, what is that one motivation, at least from an Indian perspective, of why did people travel? Uh, okay, this is my personal uh, understanding, and it may differ from the others, but I think territory itself played a lot, a, a big part. I think that the fact that it, it was a quasi-state structure, the fact that they said that you could go live there under this interpretation of Sharia, uh, in this pure land, which was promised for, uh, you know, for a long time, and it, you know, others such as Al-Qaeda have, um, uh, have not been able to do it till now, but they managed to do it. Uh, we would go and like to live in that ecosystem. And whether that means, uh, and in, in most cases, they all thought by living means fighting for it as well. A lot of Indian, uh, uh, Indian people who managed to reach there actually didn't become fighters. Uh, some did, uh, but um, uh, there, was, there was racism within ISIS as well. You know, uh, uh, the Arabs were given uh, the more prominent positions, the South Asians not so prominent positions. Hmm. So, um, but I think territory played a vital part. That whole idea of a quasi-state played a vital part. Once that idea of quasi-state existed, uh, it's, it's always uh, wrapped around a certain ideology. So it was one plus one going into two kind of situation. So the ideology was, of course, something that the, they went towards. But the fact that the territory existed where that ideology was practiced was very inviting to a lot of these people, which is why a lot of them refused to commit attacks domestically and wanted to get up and go and live there, at least from, uh, from the Indian cases. Indrani, do you have uh, any uh, comments to add to that? Because, you know, this is a question that we all get asked a lot. You know, wh why is it, what is the attraction uh, of such a group in India? If there is, is there, um, uh, is there at all really an attraction? And, you know, when we look at radicalization, after all, there is uh, a, a general consensus that everybody in a community does not get radicalized. So what is it that creates that kind of tipping point for some and not for others? Well, I would say there are different, I, I mean, I cannot say a one size fits all uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of uh, uh, motivations for radicalization, especially in, in the South Asian context. Uh, because if you just look at the, look at what is, what is on offer, I mean, I take, uh, I find Kabir's argument quite compelling about the, in, the about the, um, the attraction for territory. And it would, that would be, a way of explaining why Kashmir uh, does not have, I mean, why Kashmir should have been a breeding ground for ISIS, but it isn't. Because Kashmir is not uh, what, it's not part of that pan-Islamic agenda. And to be mm -hmm. honest with you, the, uh, the masters of the separatist movement, if you believe that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, um, uh, ideology or, the, or a lot of the um, inspiration uh, comes from across the border. Uh, 
the last thing they would like is for Kashmir to have a pan-Islamic movement. Because it is a question of territory, but in a different context. That's right. So yeah. there is a, so if, if uh, so Kabir, I think Kabir's made a very valid point about territory be in that part, in, in, the, in the part of the Middle East, where uh, the fighters from India wanted to go because they were looking for that idealized piece of land. You know, they, some of them may have been diverted to Afghanistan because, hey, you know, you could think of an idealized piece of land there too. Uh, mm. Or you could have been recruited by um, people on the way to become part of ISKP. And I don't think the divisions are uh, absolute uh, because if you then, if, if, if you put this argument, then you look at an argument, then you look at attacks in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and say, then why? Why did that happen? Hmm. Because if that, if, if, if territory, uh, an idealized state is what you were looking for, I would say then Kabir's earlier argument of, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and an argument that Rafaelo made as well, you know, the middle classes, upper middle classes, looking for their space, you know, where does, which ideology should I center myself in? in? And you may be able to explain those attacks there. But in, on, uh, in, in India, the, the motivation for radicalization could be any number of things. And if you look at the number of, uh, we, as from our perspective, we look at the number of uh, potential um, drivers. Triggers, yeah. drivers. Uh, you would then you then look at the numbers and say, why so few? Mm -hmm. I mean, what is it about the chaos that we live in that is so damn attractive yeah. that even ISIS fails? So <laughs> that's a good question. I think Raffaello. I mean, that's if there's a lesson that India can actually share with uh, other countries grappling with this, perhaps when we find the answer to that ourselves uh, is one such question. But this idea on you know, uh, global frameworks, global cooperation, what is the way forward in both combating, uh, you know, the other manifestations of terrorism? I mean, we've, we've been talking about ISIS's loss of territory, ISIS's loss of leadership, uh, and, you know, the group is dwindling. Uh, but we're constantly concerned about how it's going to reinvent itself or, you know, what kind of model is going to appear next. I mean, is it the kind of, uh, franchise model that they've, they've uh, uh, that Al Qaeda, for example, might have operated on as well uh, in the past. What is the future? Because the uncertainty about whether this group is finished, diminished, uh, is is a real one, and uh, for for the public and for citizens of the world and for governments alike. I mean, I think that it's. Uh, I think the the model that ISIS seems to be following, I would argue, is broadly the same as the one we saw Al-Qaeda do before, which is the ideology started with a sort of group, a core group, that achieved some success, that, achieved, that success drew others to it, and then we started to see lots of other issues around the world, areas where you had a conflict which involved Muslims on one side, or even Muslims on both sides, you know, taking then the sort of garb of Al-Qaeda at the time hmm. and using that to sort of articulate their struggle in a sort of more global frame. And I think you're seeing that with ISIS now all over the world as well. Um, I think what's changed is in a way, it's the way that ISIS communicates with us and the way ISIS is trying to push its message out there. And also the looseness with which it's willing to sort of let some of these affiliates grow. I mean, Al-Qaeda was quite tight about who was able to join Al-Qaeda. You know, you could only join Al-Qaeda if you know, they, they said it was okay. And if you knew Osama bin Laden, right. God yeah. knows when. Whereas now ISIS is much more laissez-faire about it. They're like, well, you know, you don't attack. It kind of looks like what we're telling people to do. That's one of us, you know what I mean? So it's a much more kind of open approach and it sort of has a catch-all thing. I mean, in some ways, what comes next? I think that's, that's an interesting question. I would argue that actually um, the question I open in the bigger frame of political violence and terrorism more generally, which is that I would suggest that, you know, uh, the sort of arc of violent political Islamism is going to continue, I think, for some time um, because it's got a very long tail and you can see lots of reasons why it's going to you know, continue to resonate in certain parts of the world. But I would wonder about other ideologies that we're seeing rise or other ideologies that are becoming more prominent. And I think that's where you're going to see sort of more of the future problems emerging from.
um, mm -hmm. which will sort of surprise us. I have a feeling that ISIS Al Qaeda will continue to be realities for some time into the future. And I would suggest that you might even start seeing them coming together a bit more um, in some specific locations. Uh, you can already see this a little bit in the Sahel, um, but I would wonder if, for example, in even a place like South Asia, if you start to see more of a greater confluence in some places between the kind of ISIS factions. Because ultimately, the ideology they're espousing is not that far from each other, uh, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, you know, they're basically saying the same thing. It's just the degrees of success and the leadership that are kind of different. Right. Indani, I know you wanted to come in here just uh, as I was asking Rafael the question. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, Rafael touched on it. Uh, because if you, if you look at where ISIS is, is today, I mean, where, what, where is ISIS's growth area? Look at Burkina Faso. I mean, Burkina Faso is actually in danger of falling to, the, to ISIS. It mm. is probably the, the only country right now that is, uh, and it, uh, broadly in the Sahel region, uh, in uh, parts of Africa, you do see the growth and the rise of ISIS. So uh, you can then say, yes, ungoverned spaces, weak institutions, weak governance, uh, all of that. Uh, which is what you said for I, which is what we said for Al Qaeda as well. I would I would actually also uh, caution ourselves into no, from believing that Al Qaeda itself is dead. I actually see the Al Qaeda um, fairly strong, mm. uh, and sort of at least getting stronger, um, not in the high profile way when bin Laden was alive, but in the much more of a low-key way, which is the way of, of Zawahiri. And mm. I, I would not write off uh, Al-Qaeda at all. Uh, mm. So I think this, this, this area is ripe for new developments. I think we'll have to wait for the pandemic to get over and everybody to get back to their normal businesses before we see more Including action. Including these groups, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kabir, in fact, that's a good note to have you conclude on because a lot of questions and a lot of comments have come in from our panelists about uh, the future, not just in terms of a way forward generally, but also uh, in a post-COVID world. In fact, we saw, um, we didn't know what to make of it. I remember you posted tweets about it as well, and many of us did about how ISIS was warning its um, fighters against COVID or being infected with COVID and things like that, which uh, seemed funny at that time, but that, you know, there's dark humor everywhere. So I guess uh, that accounted for that. But you know, really, that, that is an interesting question. I mean, and Rani's just made the point that one will have to see where the chips fall when this, when we out, when we come out or emerge, you know, at the other end of this pandemic. Uh, do you have any predictions? Vis -a -vis um, both the fight uh, against terrorism as well as, uh, you know, what they intend to, to do. Right. Uh, I'm not very comfortable making predictions in these things. They almost <laughs> always go wrong. But but I'll just uh, I'll just touch on a couple of points that were mentioned by uh, by both the panelists. I think it's very important to realize, and Raffaello uh, sort of uh, just touched upon that uh, uh, that uh, I've I've always uh, uh, maintained that Al Qaeda uh, is playing always playing the long game, hmm. and they are not the Hollywood rock stars that the ISIS comes off as. Right. They're much more measured. But this was also one of the reasons why ISIS exists. is because when Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a thing, uh, the leader at that time, Zarqawi, had significant differences with bin Laden on the way Al and, and, and the speed at which Al-Qaeda was working towards sort of the larger aim. Uh, uh, and Zarqawi wanted Al-Qaeda to attack in a much broader uh, uh, frame than just Israeli uh, or the American targets. And that was actually uh, uh, one of the sort of um, starting seeds of how ISIS came to being, is a disagreement with Al-Qaeda. But even then, Al-Qaeda is something I, uh, I feel which is much more grounded and measured in what it wants to achieve over a long period of time. They're not in any hurry. And that is why I think they will, uh, the probability of their survival has always been much higher than the survival of Islamic State, which had territory. Uh, territory uh, under a quasi sort of uh, um, uh, under a militant group was always going to be temporary. It's never going to be uh, formalized. Uh, 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 so that's just that's just one part of it. As far as you know, uh, COVID goes, uh, and me and Raf did a story also recently on um, how these groups uh, can use this sort of ecosystem of a pandemic to strengthen their bases. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you have to remember that, uh, uh, yeah, of course, you know, uh, Islamic State is telling its uh, people, look, don't, uh, I don't know, venture out or travel or whatever, uh, whatever language they used. And, and, you know, there are a lot of stories at, at that point of time that Islamic State saying uh, that don't, uh, to its fighters not to travel to Europe, for example. I think that was a mistranslation, just got picked up out of one translated piece of uh, work and went viral from there. Uh, but but it shows the legitimacy of the group, right? They're just trying to sort of uh, uh, pin down the fact that they're still in sort of some sort of control over a certain amount of population or land where they are sort of uh, giving their um, uh, uh, view as the leadership, so to speak, or the mothership of, 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 of a group. And whether that group is territorially diminished or not really doesn't matter. They still want to portray themselves as fully in control, specifically after the death of Baghdadi. Um, um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, and if we see a sort of uh, uh, play coming into, uh, uh, coming into view where governments in, 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 in the Middle East start uh, becoming weaker, mm -hmm. like for example, the Iraqi government, Iraq was, a, Northern Iraq specifically was a big play for, uh, for Islamic State in 2014, 15, 16. Uh, for the Iraqi government right now, COVID is not the biggest crisis. The oil prices caused because right. of COVID are a much bigger crisis because right. the Iraqi economy runs 90% out of oil money. And now if you remove that by 30 or 40% from their annual revenue, the government is going to be shaky, leaving more political space and political vacuum for groups like Islamic State to enter or Al-Qaeda to enter. Again, going back to 2014, this is precisely the way Islamic State made its way through Iraq in northern mm. Iraq was the vacuum. So, uh, so I mean, you know, it's it's COVID in itself may not be sort of the pandemic may not be uh, you know, the biggest uh, influence of decision making for a, a terror group such as Islamic State, but how it affects our world order or regional order in the Middle East in general is certainly going to come into play. Well, I think Kabir, thanks a lot. That's a good note. Uh, I mean, when I say good, it's all relative. Uh, that's a concerning note, but a good note as well to end this discussion on because it gives our participants and all of us some food for thought as well. But uh, we're at the end of um, this webinar. So thank you all very much. Uh, Indrani, Raffaello, uh, glad to have you on board from Singapore, Raffaello and Indrani. I know it took some time to get you in, but you didn't miss much. And we were glad to have your comments at the end. Kabir, congratulations on what we all agree is an important gap that you have filled on research on violent extremism, terrorism, and the Islamic State in South Asia and India. All the very best to all of you. Stay safe, stay home, uh, and we'll hopefully see you all in person uh, sometime in the near future. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank everyone.